These are a couple of uh, just straight factual questions, uh, the first of which you've partly answered. Uh, did Jefferson have many of his slaves, other slaves, uh, inoculated? And the second question was, was James and Sally Hemings taught to read? You know, Sally Hemings, we don't know. It, we, we, have, we have no letters from Sally Hemings. James Hemings knew how to read. Robert Hemings knew how to read. His letters, um, this is sort of an interesting twist on the John Wales things. John Wales gets sort of a bad rap, well, because he was a slave trader, that little thing. Um, but, you know, in terms of, well, he didn't free the kids and all this, but, you know, he was under the statute, 1723 statute was still in effect when he was alive. And in order to free his children, he would have had to ask the governor and the council and make the claim that they had you know, contributed some meritorious service to him. I mean, the liberalization and emancipation came after he was dead. But it's interesting to me that we know that his sons, Robert and James, knew how to read. And James, apparently from his inv cooking inventory, that a list of this inventory that I uh, reproduce in his book, and has been reproduced in lots of places, show that it's good handwriting, pretty high proficiency, very high proficiency. So. We knew James and Robert Hemings knew how to read. We don't know about Sally Hemings because we have no writing from her. But it would strike me as odd if her brothers knew how to read and write and no one, at them they, she didn't know how to read and write at all. So, but no, I don't know. We don't, we don't have any record of her, but we have records of, of her older brothers uh, being able to read it apparently uh, proficiently, at a proficient level. Read and write. Because reading and writing are separate. There were some people who knew how to read, people who had to read but didn't know how to write. But they knew how to read and write. Well, I'll make this the final question, but there will be an opportunity. Annette would be happy to take questions afterwards. Uh, she'll be signing books in the Berkeley Room upstairs, uh, just along the corridor to the right of the entrance. Uh, so many enslaved people did not have last names. Not so Sally and James. When did they acquire their last names? And did other enslaved people have last names during their time of servitude? Um, there's Al Herbert Goodman, um, the Black Slaps Family and Slavery and Freedom, talks very much about slaves' last names. Um, you know, it's it apparently slaves had last names, and slave people had last names, it's just the masters didn't use them. Um, after slavery, some people took different names, but you know, it would seem odd to me, and from, you can sort of tell from people's oral histories of their families and so forth, that they had names, but owners did not use the name. Jefferson very often used diminutive for people's, diminutives for people's names, or did not put people's last names. Um, the Gillette family, Cinder has made this point, I mean, this guy, Israel J Jefferson, who appears as Israel Jefferson's lat was a part of the Gillette family. And um, slaves had last names, it's just that owners either didn't know them or just chose not to use them. Um, George Washington um, refers to his, his manservant, uh, William Lee, uh, William who calls himself Lee. And you get this sense like, well, it's not like really a last name. Um, he calls himself that, it's not really a last name, but I, I slave, enslaved people did have last names. I mean, Madison Hemings said that the, the, the last name Hemings comes from a, a great, his great grandfather, uh, an English ship captain named uh, Hemings. So the family had the name, they certainly had the name during the time of John Wales, you know, they, they referred to them uh, as, as Hemings. So, um, a long time, at least, I mean, from the time of fathers. And also, people took the last name of their fathers sometimes, even if, if the, the father was white. Maybe one more, no, not time for any more? Uh, he's, he's looking for short things, pithy things so we can. All right, well, here's one. Uh, does any research uh, being done to prove or disprove that Joseph Fawcett and uh, uh, Betsy Hemings were Jefferson's children? Well, this is one of my end notes. I don't, um, there's a story that the oral history of a family um, suggests that Joseph Fawcett was Jefferson's son, and there's an oral history that um, Wormley Hughes was Jefferson's son. And I, 
I have not done any more research other than asking people about these oral histories. I haven't been able to find, I was not able to find anything from the contemporary time to support either one of those things. Um, Betsy Hemings, um, no, I have no idea who her father was. Uh, I think that there's one line of a family that says that, that she was his daughter as well, but I haven't found anything so, to support that. Um, the Wormley Hughes story, um, well, two things. I mean, my, my first part, I start first with the obvious, you know, why are their last names Fawcett? Why would his last name be Fawcett um, if, and not Hemmings, if there was not, people understood that last name signal paternity. And the way I discuss it in the book is to say that, you know, when, when in doubt, I would sort of go with what the people themselves, the enslaved people, how they figured their lives rather than their descendants, maybe. Um, Betsy Hemmings, it's, it's a mystery to me. I, I have no, I, I don't, I don't even discuss that in the book as to whether or not, because I've just heard that, but there's nothing, I look for something from the contemporary time that bolsters what, or jibes with what someone is saying in a form of oral history, because, I mean, I'm, oral history is important and it's something that's useful, but to me, it has to match up with things that are going on that I can be, you know, pretty sure about that are going on in the contemporary time, and I haven't found anything. Well, Edmund Morgan, uh, who's Professor Emeritus at Yale and one of the great figures of American colonial history, describes this as a brilliant book in a recent review in the New York Review of Books. Uh, it is indeed a remarkable achievement because it tells the history of slavery through the lives of individuals, which at one time I suddenly thought was not possible. And it makes that history much more poignant than statistical studies and conceptual studies. It engages the emotions, not just the intellect. Congratulations. Thank you.